And when you think about treatment of endovascular, using endovascular therapy for aortailiac disease, severe aortailiac disease, then you kind of nar narrow down to either doing angioplasty, us uh, usually kissing, it's pretty rare these days, you, you pretty much have to use a stent or a stent graft. There's CRAB that you've heard about before, and then there are aortic endografts that I'd like to uh, dive into. And aortic endografts really came about as part of the endovascular revolution that occurred in the uh, treatment of aortic aneurysms. They were separately uh, um, developed in the Ukraine by uh, Dr. Volodos and in Argentina by Dr. Parodi uh, to be applied to treatment of uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms. And there are many endografts out there in the United States. These are all the grafts that uh, have been at some point or are currently available in the United States. And you see uh, when the grafts were approved by the FDA, some of those grafts are no longer on the market. And then uh, some of those grafts have been developed into new models, uh, as you see on the right side of this uh, table. And when you think about these endografts, there are really two types of endografts out there. There are the kinds that are modular, which where multiple pieces are, are basically assembled together inside the aorta iliac segment and some are unibody. And endografts have a number of uh, uh, components in broad strokes. First of all, there is the stent or the integrated wire form that's either made out of nitinol or cobalt cr uh, chromium or stainless steel. Uh, it might be self-expanding or rarely these days balloon expandable. The graft material is either expanded polytetrafluoroethylene or polyester. Uh, the graft can be either on the inside or the outside, and this is actually uh, of the stent, and that's actually very relevant, as you will see in a couple of slides, for treatment of aorta iliac disease. And there are various attachments components, and the reason these attachments components are important is because these grafts were developed for large arteries to treat aneurysms. Uh, and so uh, there is a risk of migration, and so to that end, a lot of these stent grafts either have super renal stents or hooks, barbs, anchors, and so forth. And so today, uh, I would say 80 to 85% of all abdominal aortic aneurysms are treated with endovascular aneurysm repair using these endografts. But they have been used to treat both aortic trauma and occlusive disease. Uh, and you have to keep in mind that they have not been designed to treat small aortas. Uh, and they are off-label for these particular indications. And so what are some advantages of using an endograft in occlusive disease? Well, they can protect against distal atherembolism. They can protect against aorta iliac rupture in the setting of calcified lesions. Um, they can preserve the aortic bifurcation, uh, which can minimize flow disturbances. Not all of them, but some can. Uh, they can avoid lymph flow competition in distal aorta. And they can allow for easy access through the aorta for future endovascular interventions. But there are some disadvantages as well. The devices are quite large um, uh, and sometimes hard to deliver through the iliac arteries because of their size. The aorta might be small for the device to fully open. For a, um, for a modular device, you have to be able to cannulate the contralateral gate from the contralateral side. And if that gate it does not open because there is no space for it to open, then you can't do the case or it's hard to do the case. Sometimes you're covering important collaterals. Uh, that might be important. This is something we talked about earlier this morning. Uh, uh, many of them have relatively low radial force, and so uh, they may require stents uh, for support inside the graft. The procedure can be complex, is time consuming, and these stent grafts are expensive. So out of all of these stent grafts, many have been tried in case reports here and there, but really the most common one is the AFX device. Now in its second a version AFX2 is a device that is unibody, so there's no need to cannulate contralateral uh, gate. It allows for placement of the graft on the native aortic bifurcation, and this is sort of, it's touted for that because to avoid migration, it actually sits on aortic bif bifurcation. Um, uh, but uh, in, in treatment of aortic iliac disease, that, that may not be as important, but what is important is it does preserve the aortic uh, bifurcation. It has an endoskeleton, meaning that the, uh, the, the uh, the um, uh, material is outside the stent, which means that it can be placed in a much smaller aorta than it's designed, and there is not uh, much less risk for infolding of the material because the material is on the outside of the, of the stent. 
Uh, and it's, uh, it requires a ipsilateral 17 French sheath to deliver and a contralateral 7 French sheath. And so these are the components of the device. Uh, on, on the right is the main body, and the left are the aortic and iliac extensions that are of less relevance. Uh, but the point is, is that the smallest device they have is a 22 millimeter diameter uh, 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 device with multiple lengths, as you can see here, with a 13 millimeter iliac uh, 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 diameter limb. But this device, even though it's approved for a, a aorta of around 18 millimeters, can actually be placed in a much smaller aorta uh, uh, without infolding of the, of the material. And in broad strokes, uh, you basically gain access, you deliver the device uh, over a stiff wire, you also feed in a wire, uh, uh, a contralateral wire into the same sheath. That uh, contralateral wire is then um, a grasp, snared, if you will, at the, in the, at the aortic bifurcation and pulled down into the through the contralateral uh, 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 limb and groin as the device is advanced into the aorta, then the main body is deployed, the contralateral limb is deployed, the wire is released, and then you're able to, as you do that, actually put a pigtail back into the endograft, and then you release the uh, ipsilateral limb. And so the strategy for deployment of, these, of this particular device is that you obviously have to recanalize uh, diseased arteries, and you have to predilate them. They have to be big enough. The aorta has to be big enough for the device not only to be placed through, but to be able to rotate it, because sometimes you can get a wire loop uh, that you have to resolve by rotating the device, and you cannot do that if there's no space to do, to, to, to do that rotation. Uh, you, uh, uh, ipsilateral access is typically done percutaneously using the, the pre-closed techniques, However, if a patient has moderate or severe femoral disease, you can't do that, and so you have to deliver the device through the open groin and then do a femoral endarterectomy. Uh, you have to obviously insert the, the device through the least diseased iliac vessel, uh, and then you can place an aortic extension cuff to cover the entire inferior aorta, uh, which may be diseased as well. You have to post-dilate the aorta, and then you have to see whether or not, in fact, uh, uh, there's such surrounding calcification that you, you, you need to de deploy a balloon expandable stent in the aorta or the uh, iliac limbs to be able to actually open up the device um, to avoid uh, thrombosis. There's some, uh, a bunch of studies on this device. Uh, there is, this is a retrospective observational study of 20 patients uh, with AFX compared with 67 patients of aortic ephemeral graft, uh, severe iliac disease, so it was successful 100% of the time. Six patients required an endarterectomy. Uh, six patients required iliac stents. The length of stay for these patients was much shorter than for surgical patients. But the immediate hemodynamic improvement and freedom for in or interventions was less than uh, for aortobifemoral bypass. And here's another series. This is the largest multi-site uh, 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 series of AFX uh, grafts. Uh, 91 patients, 100% technical success. You can see the complications there. Um, but important to note that an, a fair number of these patients required an aortic stent inside the uh, endograft, iliac stents, and a femoral endarterectomy. So when do you consider an, an endograft in severe aortic iliac occlusive disease? Well, I think you, you, you do that in high-risk patients who have severe symptomatic combined intrarenal and common iliac occlusive disease. You also may want to consider it in patients with distal microembolism from a focal source in an inferior aorta or at the aortic bifurcation. Obviously, if you do that, you should do that through the open groin with control of outflow so you don't embolize further. When do you not do that? Well, you probably don't want to do that in patients who are candidates for aorta of femoral bypass because, the, frankly, that oper operation uh, is more durable. You don't want to do it in patients who have very small, severely diseased or calcified aorta aorta or iliac arteries, um, and you want to be careful when you're dealing with uh, the aorta close to the renal arteries because, particularly in, in the setting of occlusion, because you, that can uh, risk embolization. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. Safe travels to you. We will uh, review your lecture after you're gone. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll proceed down. You know, the, if you look carefully at the agenda designed by Dr. Shishabor, um, there are a lot of challenging talks, challenging the speaker. So we have invited the, another vascular surgeon, Dr. Sherling Sai, uh, to talk about a supervised exercise program and medical therapy for aortoiliac disease. Is Sherling here in the room? Okay.
I don't have my glasses. All right, no problem. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay, I can read them. Thanks. Um, good afternoon. I wanted to thank the uh, organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about supervised exercise therapy and medical management for aortoiliac occlusive disease. And I have to thank Dr. Banerjee for really giving me these interesting topics. I mean, who has a vascular surgeon talk about medical management of aortoiliac <laughs> occlusive disease? But really, supervised exercise therapy is something near and dear to my heart, as he knows very well. So uh, oh, let's see. I have no disclosures. So after we ta have heard a lot about you know all the creative ways to treat aortoiliac disease, I think we have to just step back and remember that intermittent claudication is actually the most common symptomatic manifestation of lower extremity PAD. And of these people who have claudication, most of them over the next five years remain with claudication. Actually, a very small number progress to limb-threatening ischemia, but a lot have other manifestations of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, including death. So medical management is a big part of managing patients with PAD. And so we know this, that medical management is centered around smoking cessation, antiplatelets with aspirin, lipid reduction, lipid lowering with um, statins, um, glycemic control, celostazole, et cetera, et cetera. But and, oh, and some evidence for LDL and statins. So this was a retrospective study from the VA, national VA data. We all know that statins decrease um, uh, major cardiac events in people with PAD, but actually even low-dose statins seem to impact amputation, likelihood of amputation. So that was very interesting. But if you look at the analysis from the 4A trial, at really low levels of LDL, you can actually see changes in limb outcomes, not just cardiac outcomes, but limb outcomes in people with PAD. So another reason why you know good medical management impacts their cardiovascular, overall cardiovascular outcomes, but maybe also their limb outcomes as well. But although we as physicians worry about all of these things, MI, strokes, et cetera, for the patient, the most vexing thing is their inability to walk. And this is a huge detriment on their quality of life. So the SBS recently published their appropriate use guidelines for management of patients with intermittent claudication. And after a fair amount of uh, discussion, a review of a whole bunch of scenarios of patients with various forms of aortoiliac disease and other comorbidities, et cetera, they came up and agreed that exercise therapy is the, has the most favorable risk-benefit profile compared to open inline revascularization, extra anatomic revascularization, and endovascular revascularization. So claudication can occur from either aortoiliac disease or SFA popliteal disease. And although exercise therapy is recommended, we've always asked ourselves, well, do patients with aortoiliac occlusive disease really benefit from exercise therapy? Because these are the patients who come to clinic and they have, those are the ones with like severe short distance claudication and they are miserable, right? And we think that they probably have worse claudication because they have this proximal lesion. And generally we try to treat them because these iliac occlusions tend to do better, like the technical success can be better and the durability of iliac stents compared to SFA stents tends to be a little better. So we try to treat them. So the question is, does exercise therapy work for patients with iliac occlusive disease? And so this was addressed, or they tried to address this in the super trial. This was a recently published in European Journal of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery, randomized control trial looking at patients with claudication secondary to iliac occlusive disease. And the patients were randomized to either endovascular intervention or supervised exercise therapy. And after a year, there was both arms had improvement in maximal walking distance. And really, there was no difference between the interventional group or the exercise group. Both arms had improvement in quality of life. And there was a little bit of a better improvement in the interventional group than the exercise group, but both sides improved. But if you look at the cost, there was a big difference, which is not surprising, right? So in the, super, in the interventional group, there was a significantly higher cost, and this was driven mostly by the cost associated with hospital admission or surgical admission, uh, admission for the surgery. And this is despite the tremendous number of outpatient visits incurred by the supervised exercise group, um, which is pretty significant. So in summary, this study seems to suggest that even for patients with iliac occlusive disease, supervised exercise therapy is as good as endovascular revascularization and it's more cost effective. 
So supervised exercise therapy is the recommended approach or initial approach. It has a 1A recommendation from the AHA, but it has a lot of challenges. Basically, you're telling your patients that you want them to show up to a gym three times a week, which is difficult for many of us. So in some patients, it may be beneficial to put them on a structured home-based exercise therapy. The data for this is not quite as strong because the data are all over the place. So here's one example of a study that randomized patients to either supervised exercise therapy or home-based exercise therapy. And they concluded that home-based therapy was as good as supervised exercise therapy in terms of improvements in walking and in quality of life. Then a more recent study randomized patients to home exercise therapy versus usual care. And actually in this case, there was no difference between the two. So how are these different? And I think it's from the, the structured feedback or the, it's not necessarily the home walking, but it's actually in the feedback or supervision component. A lot of these, most of these home exercise therapies have two components some form of remote monitoring, which can be a pedometer, a smartwatch, um, a Fitbit, whatever you want, or uh, you know, even just a diary, some way to monitor the, um, the exercise, and then some sort of supervision or feedback. And this comes in all forms, too. It can be a nurse or a physiotherapist who calls the patient once a week, three times a week. Sometimes there is just coaching on the walking, but sometimes there is some other behavioral modification, so motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, and in some of these programs, the patients actually show up in a group to do like group cognitive behavioral therapy a couple times and over, over the 12 weeks of exercise therapy. So there is a huge range in what happens in the supervision feedback part of this, and that may be where we see the differences in these studies. So what goes into a successful home exercise program? This was written up in a very good article in circulation a couple of years ago. Most of these programs are based on sessions that occur three to five times a week, and it's always graduated. So the patient often starts off with like 10 minutes of walking at a time, and over time they add five minutes to a session each week. So it's graduated, and so by the time of 12 weeks, they're probably exercising 45 to 50 minutes, ideally, each session. There has to be some sort of activity monitor, which can be whatever they can use, a watch, a pedometer, a Fitbit. But on the other side of the patient monitoring themselves, you need to have a coach, a coach to whom the patient is accountable and can ultimately sort of motivate them. And the motivation comes from the patient identifying their goals. So it's important that the patient identify their own goals for walking, because this is ultimately behavioral modifications, sort of improving their lifestyles. So the patient has to identify, well, I want to walk my dog, or I want to check the mail, or I want to play golf without a golf cart. Um, so things like that, those actually go to help with the motivational part um, and the accountability. Because when you think about it, this is behavioral modification. To the patient, this seems, this walking program may seem like an endless flight of stairs, like going up an endless flight of stairs. But with the appropriate motivation and coaching, we can all make it to the top. Uh, thank you, Sherilyn. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation, and you should always give this talk, in my opinion. Uh, the next uh, presentation is uh, Dr. Mohammed Ansari, and he's going to be. Uh, his topic is very interesting. I wish I had sent it. I wish I had sent this aortoiliac occlusion to surgery. I wish I had not sent it. This aortoiliac occlusion. So this was a setup that Dr. Banerjee trapped me. You know, he wanted me to present a case full of issues and wanted me to admit that I missed my surgeon that day. But it's nice that these are important cases to see. I have Dr. Feldman, my mentor from Cornell, in the arena, so it's awesome. I'm going to talk about dirty laundry in front of him. But this is very interesting, and this is, uh, uh, this is a case we talked about once in the past, and then I ran into a similar situation, so it's very interesting. So let's see my disclosures. So when we talk about aortoiliac occlusion, I do want to thank Dr. Banerjee and Mary Shubha for this invitation because a lot of things come up when we discuss these cases and it's very educational. When we talk about going after the disease, the question is about stenosis, occlusion, and the combo behavior when we have stenosis versus aneurysms both in the same vessel. The timeline for it, the patency, the history of the patient, various comorbidities, what procedures we can do. Is it renal function involved, CHF, COPD, can anesthesia be involved? 
and the device use, and what about the native vessels, past surgical grafts, or future surgical grafts, and then the infection. So there are a lot of things involved when we try to plan these cases. And that's what I end up one day, when I was very excited, beginning the day, and towards the end of the day, imagine how these things always come towards the day end. Right? They never come early in the morning when you come in there. It would be always, you'll be tired, exhausted, leaving, and these days cases will come. A 58-year-old guy, past medical history, hypertension, diabetes, hypolipidemia, coronary artery disease, severe PAD reported uh, with reported vascular surgery in the past, current smoker. Now, we don't know what kind of vascular surgery. There was vascular surgery in the past. Current smoker presents to the ER with acute limb ischemia. They think it is acute limb ischemia. Ultrasound in the ER shows no flow in the SFA, and they think something above has happened in the autoiliac region. Physical examination, no pulses movement. Referred from another medical centers, and two physicians failed to intervene. Now, going through the procedure, I said, okay, let's get an ultrasound. We'll do the abdominal aortogram, and this is what we get when we brought the patient upstairs. So severe disease is still aorta, and com one limb is completely down, and the other also has significant disease. And this is what we get when the patient, the initial radiographs. I had difficulty uh, putting pic uh, videos in, so it's uh, picture-based, but I've taken good pictures, so it can be fun. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Should I come down radial or brachial? Let's see, I, I tried that. It didn't work. Nothing can pass. There is some kind of an issue in the beginning of that limb that even though I went with the back of a wire, which we're not supposed to do, but anyway, so uh, it wouldn't budge. And then I have nothing, something trickled down. Why? Because I went through that limb and I, I, I was able to do this is what I get, but nothing in return. And I'm like, okay, let's use ultrasound. The issue is I tried to reach out to the vascular surgeon. I said it would be very helpful. He said, I am two and a half hours away. I can make it happen if you really want me. And my biggest fault at that time, I said, you know what? No, it's okay, I'll take care of it. I should have not done that. So I missed my vascular surgeon that day. And this is a situation I have. How do I, do, how do I go on the other side? We have no history, nothing. We couldn't get a CT scan on him as well, and he's up on the table. I'm like, okay, with the ultrasound, I was able to locate a graft, a fem fem graft. So I said, okay, since we have no issues over here and we want everything to be done, I'll go into that graft. So pictures, again, dry, nothing. I decided to put the sheath in withdraw the sheath, try to curtail my sheet into the graft. And I was able to go into the graft, pass the wire, and I'm in the fem-fem graft now. And I'm like, okay, this looks really interesting. I still miss my vascular surgeon. I should have told him to come back. But anyway, let's continue. I was able to pass the wire into the common femoral, and I felt really good. I said, okay, we wired it, changed the sheet to the other side, and I was able to restore some flow down when I went down. I said, okay, now the flow is opening. Because the issue is the aortoiliac is so tight over there that we cannot do anything. And even if he put, wants to put the graft in, where would he do that? There was some former graft and it's all gone. Then we find out about the history with the graft being over there. Okay, he had the fem-fem graft surgery and he has some issue he's talking about in the left groin, but he's not sure about that. I said, okay, let's get a pedal access to see if we can come from downstairs as well. Try to mix both the wires in and I was able to connect these two wires from below and from above. And I was able to start my balloon angioplasty and started doing thrombectomy at the same time. Ballooning, 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 thrombectomy, thrombectomy, thrombectomy. And after that, I was able to restore flow. So I'm like, okay, I am restoring flow, but now comes the more fun, right? Flow is coming down and I'm really happy, but it's really slow flow. It's a lot of clot over there. So what I did at this point, I said, no, this is not gonna work. And the people in the lab, their faces, and my staff, young staff at that time, they had really bad faces. They don't like long cases. Nobody liked long cases. I'm tired. I miss my vascular surgeon. I might have cursed one or two times, Dr. Banerjee. I think it's normal at this point. We went out with the fellow. Anyway, I decided to put the ECOS into the patient, send the patient to the unit. I said, let's hope for the best for tomorrow. Let's all rest. We'll return in the morning. So day two, I call the return of the mummy. And this is day two, the return of the mummy. So I go into my sheet and I see this excavation, which I said looks limited, because I injected a couple of times and it just goes into that pouch over there and below the pouch over there. All right, I decided to go ahead and stent that territory and I successfully stented it. Flow is going down, but if you look at the side of the flow, I, if the pointer works, 
Anyway, you see this excavation on the side of the flow. Let me see if the pointer works. So, all right. There is excavation on the side of the flow, and this is, this is wire bond that I put in. Wire bond is not going to have a leak. So what is happening over here, and I'm really puzzled, so I opened the ultrasound, and I said, okay, let's look what is going on over there. I don't see any flow coming through the wire bond or through the vessel. Again, I missed my vascular surgeon. I'm like, where the hell is he? But then it was my fault, right? I said, no, I'll take care of it. All right, over here there is good flow, but there is a pouch over there. Why would there be flow in the pouch when I put a wire bond over there? All right, I ballooned it, stuck the clot. I see a small leak when I turn my sheet on the other side. So there is a very small perf over there, but okay, I changed the angle of the thing and I stented that and really nicely flow, preserved flow in the common femoral, above and below all, so it all went really well. But I still have excavation over here. What is going on over here? It's a covered stent. Is this possible that Gore give me one covered stent which has leaks in it? They wouldn't do that to me, right? But what is going on over here? Why is it leak around the side? Where is the leak coming from? This is way more leak. Now I really miss my vascular surgeon. And I really wish I would have sent this to vascular surgery so I wouldn't have dealt with it because probably at this time my heart rate was 150 with proponent leak because I see this thing over there and it's coming through the end. This is a lot of leak over here. What is going on? Can we call the vascular surgeon now? We called him, he said he's two and a half hours away. If I want, he, I, he can be there. I said, I, okay, I want you to be here. He said, Mac, it might take more time than we think. But you know, don't worry, you can take care of it. The limb looks good, so I'm like, okay, let's proceed, find out what's going on. I put more ultrasound, try to suction, ballooning, went in below. I said, maybe the leak is coming from below and flowing in that direction because of the subchannel. Let's take care of the things below. I took care of the things below. I put in a supera in the popliteal, seal the edge of it with the contrast seal, and then I see good flow coming down. Not much leak on the edge, but more leak still on the other side. He's doing good, he's stable, he's hemodynamically stable, balloon down, flow going to the foot, but the excavation is still there. I'm like, okay, that's not normal. When I look at his groin, I see some discoloration and scarring that I saw before as well, and that's still the same. So I said, I asked him a question, did you ever had issue in your left groin before? This is the third time I'm asking you, but there is something, so please let me know. He said, yes, I did get an infection at that time. And I knew what is going on. So I cleaned what I could clean, and after that I ballooned. And then it was going on and on. I mean, it was getting better. But I decided at this point, I'm going to stop. I put the tourniquet on him just to help him. Flow is going to the foot, and things are getting better. But I said, I'm going to send him for a study, which I'm going to show you, because I think something else is going on. So day two, we removed the ecos, we ballooned, we put the Y-bon in, we put the supera in, we did the thrombectomy, and we were successful. And this is the CT scan that I sent him for, which actually shows that we were able to restore flow really nicely, fem fem graft going down. This is a three-dimensional structure that we create with my new uh, 3D lab that I use with the 3D printing. And it actually confirms we have good results. And then I did the tag study. When I did the tag study on him, this is a nuclear medicine leak scan. I want to find out where the leak is coming from. And we were able to find, and that's when I called the surgeon, and the surgeon took him in, and this is what he had. The old graft that was put into the patient, there were dehiscence and leakage from that old graft where it was attached. It was heavily infected, and that's where the leak was coming from. And we caught it. The surgeon treated it. This is that part, the dehiscence over there that clearly shows how it came off of it in the northern edge of the graft. So the conclusion is, he did well, walked out of the hospital, everything taken care of. Though under the limitations and circumstances, we were able to help treat and rescue the patient, but I really wish I had sent this aortoiliac seclusion to surgery. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ansari, for sharing that case. Uh, I'm gonna skip the panel discussion, unfortunately, because we're running behind, and hopefully we can catch up. Um, I'm honored to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Uh, Sensei Soga, who came here from Japan for this presentation. Or did I skip, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped Dr. Feldman. Sorry about that. So we are really behind. So Dr. Feldman, it's your turn, I'm sorry, before we go to Dr. Uh, Soga. Uh, Dr. Feldman is gonna be speaking on access site selection to treat aortoiliac disease, retrograde, brachial, radial, and so on. 
I just ask the presenters, please, to stay on time because we're a little bit behind and we want to catch up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mehdi. Thank you, Subash, for the invitation and, and congrats on running a terrific, terrific conference. So I'll focus today on um, teaching and talking about access site selection specific to treatment of aorta iliac disease. I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. Well, you've seen this slide many times. The aorta iliac disease can go from task A to very complex task D classification. And why is it important? Because we treat task C and D not infrequently. And the point is the outcomes are good. Both the primary patency as well as technical skills are good. So you will be treating complex disease and we need to know how to treat it safely. Number one point, you need good quality imaging prior to getting the patient to the cath lab. And for aorta iliac specifically, you need good CTA or MRA. Unlike the low extremities with femoral popliteal, the sonogram may be sufficient. Here you really want to understand where the occlusions are, if there are occlusions, how long, how calcified. So imaging is key. Once they're in the cath lab, once again, good imaging. You want to lay out where the lesions are. You want to make sure you get your oblique views. You're not missing any osteal. Uh, external iliac lesions. You also want to look at both DSA and non-subtracted images because you want to know how close the lesions are to the bony landmarks and to your common femoral access, which will determine whether you can treat uh, lesions from that access. This is perhaps the key slide which will tell you how to choose access in aorta iliac interventions. There are six questions that you want to answer. Number one, what is the lesion location? Is it the osteal aorta iliac disease or is it the lesion closer to the common femoral? Is there, number two question, is there contralateral iliac disease? How diffuse? Is it occluded? Are you going to be treating contralateral disease? Number three, is there common femoral disease, unilateral or bilateral? Because this may mean you need alternative access. Number four, what is the bifurcation angle? Is it too difficult to go up and over? You may want to go from um, brachial or radial. Is it a stenosis or occlusion? Occlusions, you'll typically need dual access. Very different approach. And number six, availability of alternative access. Do you have alternative brachial, radial access that you can use? So most common approach is the ipsilateral retrograde approach. Okay, your common iliac, your mid-external iliac lesions, ipsilaterally can be treated. Your contralateral lesions, common iliac, internal iliac, external iliac. Here's a sample of external iliac lesions that can be treated both ways, either from the right or the left femoral. On the other hand, when you have an osteal iliac disease, here you're going to be using kissing balloons, kissing stents, so you need bilateral access, preferably bilateral femoral, or you can have one brachial radial versus femoral access. Now, what about a more complex approach? If you have inferior uh, aortic disease, you may need to reconstruct uh, uh, grafts with, with covered stents, such as a CRAB technique. For this one, you're going to need bilateral femoral access with one femoral being a large bore access. For total occlusions in the iliacs, number one, as I mentioned, pre-procedural planning is key. You're going to need at least two access sites, sometimes three. Be ready to approach lesions integrate and retrograde. External iliac occlusions, crossover approach may be preferred. You, you can use the internal iliac to anchor your sheath and then use that sheath for crossing. The common iliac occlusions, retrograde, ipsilateral, or brachial radial may be preferred. If proximal stump, and this is a general rule, arm or contralateral approach, if distal stump, retrograde approach usually works well. Here's a case of a very osteal common iliac occlusion on the left side. We tried to go on the left. I was unable to cross. Um, and as you can see, the stump on the right side is very short. So you're not going to have much support. So in this case, we went up and over from the brachial approach and uh, uh, crossed the lesion easily, kissing balloons, and finished the case with kissing stents. Now, your brachial artery can be your friend. For patients with common femoral occlusion, severe obesity, prosthetic material in the groin, as, uh, as my colleague just showed, the aortic endograft iliac CTO, CTOs, but it can only be also be your enemy because of the complications, the pseudoaneurysms, uh, the medial nerve injury, and thrombosis can be as high as 
So radial artery is a very attractive access for aorta iliac cases. It has shorter recovery, just like in coronaries, a, a quicker ambulation, less complication, less length of stay. You can treat both iliacs at the same time. But here's what we need to remember. You need to cover the distance from the left radial to the iliac, and usually that distance is 105 to 125 centimeters. What does that mean? You need a sheath to position yourself near the ostium of the culprit iliac or above the bifurcation, and you need devices that will reach it. And you may be limited with the size of the devices. If you need more than six French, seven, eight French devices, that's challenging. And also covered in larger diameter stents, uh, they don't go with longer shaft. There's also some ergonomic challenges. You have to work from the left side. There's greater radiation exposure. The wires can be long, and it's a little bit challenging to work with longer wires. But our colleagues from the industry has done a great job inventing and helping us with the equipment to treat lesions transradially. This is just an example of some of the devices that are available. So we have the hydrophilic sheaths now that we can use, longer hydrophilic sheaths. We have balloons with 200 centimeter delivery system. These balloons up to eight millimeters in diameters. We have self-expanding stents on 200 centimeter delivery system up to eight millimeter diameter. So what we don't have is stents of larger diameter. Covered stents, no DES with shaft left length more than 135 centimeters. And the DCBs, for instance, only one maker makes them with a shaft length of 150 centimeters. So there's still room for improving devices that can be used from the transradial approach. In terms of data, um, it's a little more challenging from procedural success standpoint, comparing radial versus femoral, but no question, just like in coronary circulation, going transradially saves you in terms of access complications. In conclusion, good quality imaging, CTA or MRA to plan your approach is extremely important. I've given you the six questions that you need to answer in, uh, that will help you to determine what is the best access to treat aortic iliac uh, lesions. Be ready to approach lesions integrate and retrograde. Don't just hope you will cross quickly and you'll be done, particularly CTOs. If proximal stump, contralateral approach, or radial brachial approach will be helpful. For common femoral, um, most common larger bore access is your common femoral artery. Meticulous technique, ultrasound, uh, micropuncture, all important just like in coronaries. Kissing stents for, for osteo common iliac uh, disease. And transradial, as I mentioned, approach is evolving. We still need some better equipments in terms of longer adjunctive devices such as Ivers, thrombectomy, and covered stents. Thank you. Dimitri, I'm amazing, amazing. You nailed it, my man. You know, thank you so much for that masterful presentation. And I'm gonna now bring Sensei Soga, again, our dear friend from Japan. He just arrived, I think, this morning. I'm not sure. Uh, thank you, Sensei, for <laughs> taking the time and coming all the way here. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having, having time. Uh, it's a great honor to be here to present my presentation. Uh, this one. This one. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, first of all, uh, let me show you the case uh, who had the intermittent clarification uh, due to the high aortic occlusion. Uh, after the gateway passage, I put the self-expansive stand to cover the whole lesion uh, like this. The, the initial result, the residual stenosis was observed, but I finished this procedure. The one month later, uh, for up angiogram, self-expansive stand has been gradually expanded uh, in each, then the each uh, stand uh, stick together, uh, make her a big aorta. The five year later, 10 year later, no stenosis was found like that. Uh, as you know, that after the putting the stand for iliac occlusion, the result is pretty good. If you look at the 10-year primary patency after pulling the stent for iliac occlusion, uh, result is excellent. 74.4% uh, of the uh, primary patency at 10 year uh, was observed uh, from our analysis. Uh, the first message is here. So our result indicated that 
the long-term patency is already promising after the successful primary standing. Uh, therefore, the aim of the endovascular procedure for aortic occlusion is to put the stent successfully with no complication. Uh, let's see the details of the complication from this registry. Uh, surprisingly, more than one third of the complications was a procedure related bleeding, uh, like a hematoma, blood transfusion, as well as uh, access site complication, uh, should aneurysm or something. The second complication is a distal emboli uh, after opening the uh, blood flow or blue two. Uh, these two big complications uh, is a big issue. To avoid the bleeding complication, uh, I think that translator intervention is preferred. I will share the case, 73-year-old male who had uh, a long external iliac occlusion. Uh, I tried to open from the left radar uh, artery. The, I advanced the guide wire with loop wire technique. Yeah, after the guide wire passage, I pulled the stand to cover the whole lesion uh, uh, from the radiary access. Uh, that here is the result. Res result is excellent. It seems to be nice. It shouldn't be noted that after the procedure, he came back to the world on his own foot. So of course, as you, you know, he came into the cath lab with claudication, but after the procedure, he go back to the ward without claudication. Another case, eight year old female who had a bilateral iliac CDO, uh, I tried to open the, from the transradial approach. So of course, uh, I need a, a retrograde a supportive guide wire and the, uh, the bilateral negotiate is needed, but I succeeded to put the stent from the radiator access. And then after the procedure, she go back to the world on her own foot uh, like that. Uh, it's, it's very important uh, because it, it's, it's very easy to manage for nurses and the medicals as well as the physician after the procedure. The second, to avoid the distal emboli or blue two. Uh, I, I think the iris is a very important. Uh, there are s many, many checkpoints from the iris findings. The first, the after the guide wire passage, uh, where the guide wire is or, or something, or the guide wire is subintima or true lumen, or after the balangioplasty, the dissection earlier, the dissection angle or something. The binary, after the stenting, Ivers tells us the a position or the shape of the stent, the round shape or a crescent shape or something. Of then, uh, the important thing is for the iliac CDO, uh, the plug characteristics. Uh, if you can find the very low echoic findings, uh, it, it seems to be thrombus or thrombolytic plaque. Uh, therefore, you should uh, start considering the uh, dialect stenting or uh, 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 this protection or, or so make a small hole to deliver the uh, st stent shaft. The, if you look at the uh, high echoic frag, it may be a fibrous frag, uh, the very low risk of the distal emboli, uh, therefore you, you can do uh, as usual uh, in your daily practice. Uh, here, here is a procedure, so you can do that. The, the final findings uh, is the couch fight. The, there are three types of couch fight findings the circumreferential, the eccentric calcified nodule, and the nodular calcification. The right side is the inside of calcium. The, if you 
find that very eccentric calcium nodule or nodular calcification, uh, it's a risk of the vessel rupture. The vessel rupture is a very low, uh, however, it's lethal if occurred. Uh, therefore, uh, you can predict the by using the IVIS. The from uh, other bifurcation lesion with a heavily calcified eccentric nodule, uh, I start thinking to put the coverage scan uh, like a VVX or live stream like that you know, to treat uh, with the coverage scan or the bifurcation lesion like that. In, in summary, uh, again, mm -hmm. long term patency is a promising, uh, therefore, uh, how avoid the uh, any complication to achieve the, uh, to avoid the uh, blood access complication, the radio access is useful and uh, to avoid the disable our Bluetooth, the IVAS is uh, very helpful. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have heard a lot of technical considerations for crossing and uh, I think to do uh, the next, take the, ne take the next step, we invite Dr. Peter Monteleone from Dell Medical School to talk about his stent selection algorithm for aortic ileus. Wonderful. Peter, we are expecting some controversy on this one. <laughs> well, the, uh, so much of this is bread and butter questions, and so we'll, we'll, we'll move briskly to help us stay on time. So uh, thank you all so much for, for being here and giving the opportunity to, to speak about this. So a great document, if you want to pick one to dive into, is the Sky Guidelines on Device Selection and Aorta Iliacs, um, Arterial Interventions. We'll refer to it throughout some of these foundational questions. We're going to talk about safety. We're going to talk about the data that's available. We're going to talk about anatomic and device-based considerations and answer some key questions. You know, balloon expandable versus self-expanding, covered versus uncovered, questions about DES, questions about rules for EVA, all this good stuff as we go. So in general, balloon expandable, precision of deployment, quote unquote, stick in the landing, radial integrity, distal leaf, allow us to deal with osteolesions, self-expanding, conformability to tortuosity. Type classic, just straightforward case. So a unilateral severe lesion right at the ostea. You can come up with a bunch of different ways to treat this. If you decide that you don't have to do anything to the contralateral side, your goal is to avoid putting more metal where you don't have to put more metal. You know, the opportunity to think about treating that fo focal osteal lesion with the, in the absence of contralateral disease, if you can stick the landing with a balloon expandable stent, take optimal utilization of your imaging. I IVIS all my iliacs for sizing because there can be such broad variation. You can locate place and size a balloon expandable stent with a nice result that gives you the opportunity to also preserve future opportunities for up and over access. So straightforward, easy, nice angiographic result, and it speaks to the value of just that simple question. Balloon expandable stents with great radial integrity allow you to, to, to stick the landing. Um, case two, as we move through a little more of an interesting angiogram, we have someone with a lesion which is right at the level of the origin of the external iliac artery and the bifurcation, the internal and the external. We IVIS this as well, but when you take a look, you kind of see how it's a bit of a complicated lesion also compromising the internal iliac. Um, when you think about treating, you can see the wide discrepancy in size as well as that tortuosity that we spoke to. This was a case where it wasn't particularly densely, densely calcified, though there was some calcium. We chose to do our slow serial balloon and Inflation. We then just placed a self-expanding stent across it. We didn't use a covered stent to avoid completely stent jailing that internal iliac. We did have some reduction in flow, but a good example of just a simple uh, self-expanding stent allowing for the tortuosity, which is sized appropriately by IVIS, and a good kind of in and out treatment with self-expanding. So again, gave us that opportunity to treat. A little more controversy, covered versus uncovered. Again, data safety and anatomy. We refer often to COBEST. So when we think about COBEST, this trial, which compares covered stents to uncovered stents in aorta iliac disease and demonstrated a real benefit, including out to 18 months. Now, it's worth mentioning, and I don't know if our laser works, but maybe it doesn't. If you think about the excellent numbers that we saw in our last presentation for preserved patency of iliac interventions, and you look at the uncovered stent arm in COBEST, the uncovered stent arm in COBEST did terribly. It was 50% patent at 18 months. And so you have to ask yourself how much of the benefit of what we saw with covered stents was really a direct benefit, but good data, and they showed that data out to long term as well. So they took that 60 month difference out between covered and uncovered and demonstrated a real improvement with covered stents. Again, it raises that question of why did the uncovered stent arm do so much more terrible, <laughs> if that's the right, right, than we see in our clinical practice, and it always raises the specter of what we do. 
When we look at the VBX device, um, kind of the Viabon alternate device to the, the HMI cast, which was studied in Cobest, again, single arm prospective registry, really, really good outcomes and patency and gives even more information though in a single armed prospective uh, registry um, about what's going on there. But all this work together gives us into that sky designation for aortoiliac bifurcation, focal lesions, diffuse lesions, and particularly moderate or heavily calcified lesions within the iliacs. So something certainly to think about and it'll be interesting to hear from the panel what their primary use is. We heard an excellent talk on chronic total occlusions or total occlusions of the iliac. So here's a case where we very simply, smoothly crossed, exactly as Dr. Feldman described. We got ipsilateral access. Our wire, our simple glide wire crossed nicely. The IVIST again demonstrated we were true lumen all the way. And so we just ballooned this and then we stented this. And I used an uncovered stent here. It was a CTO, but it was soft plaque. We um, avoided the ostea. We managed to stick that landing again and had a nice result within the common iliac artery. What about another case in this 80-year-old that wanted to be able to play more golf who had a failed dialysis fistula on one side and an active dialysis fistula on the other side where we tried to get in from retrograde. My wire is somewhere near the spleen, I think, at this point, so we certainly had complications getting in from there. We worked to get in and actually managed to get up and over from above after much difficulty trying from uh, coming from the ipsilateral side. So we managed to get across, but it was certainly difficult and not the easiest cross in the world in this situation. We took advantage of the shockwave device and heavily calcified vessels to do serial low pressure inflation plus lithotripsy. And then in this situation where we had complex crossing of a heavily calcified lesion at risk for perforation, we chose to use covered devices. So we used a covered um, self-expanding distally, aiming to stay above what was a diseased common femoral, but in someone no one was taking to the OR. We then put a covered stent, and now interestingly, this is a VBX stent. So we were able to pass a big, long, covered stent up and over um, through our sheath. That speaks to the value addition of VBX versus HRMI cast. These longitudinal rings that are not connected laterally make for a much more flexible covered stent, which gave us a good result in this situation. So covered balloon expandables, again, we've got good data, particularly in task CD lesions, but always that question of do we need to use them all the time or do we use them in cases which we think there's a real benefit from that covered. Also, as mentioned in our axis case, covered stents are bigger. So our Viabonds are seven and eight French, depending on your sizes. Your V12, same thing, you know, six or, or seven or eights um, in your larger sizes. So you have to be prepared for using them. Same thing with the Viabon self-expandings where we see seven and eight French sheaths required in order to introduce those stents. When we think about treating the aorta and the bifurcation, we can be a little more thoughtful than just trying to stick the landing. You know, this is where that concept of, of CEREB, which we've heard covered endovascular revascularization of the aortic bifurcation comes up. Good data, particularly with covered stents where you're worried about perforation in the aorta as well. We placed an aortic stent. We placed two um, uh, pant leg stents extending into that aortic stent, and you just get the best angiograms in the world. There's a lot of, uh, you'll never be able to go up and over, but you get a nice protected treatment of an aortailiac bifurcation. DES is simple, there's no data, there's no guideline, we don't do it. Some aortas are super complicated. This was my setup slide as we were talking about what uh, the talk that came first, which was going to come later, when we started thinking about treatment of uh, concomitant aneurysmal and, and stenotic disease and thinking about EVAR. So in conclusion, balloon expandable, sticking the landing, nice distal radial force, um, self-expanding, allowing you to deal with tortuosity. Some data, which we've got to be thoughtful about, about utilization of covered devices, no data for drug-eluting devices. Question future uses of EVAR, though, again, very, very expensive and much, much, much to learn. So thank you all. Uh, Peter, thank you so much. That was great. I think let's uh, spend a few minutes uh, and uh, do a little bit of discussion. Dr. Metzger just reminded me that Dr. Farber uh, already did his presentation, so we have a few minutes. So Mazen, I'm coming to you. And uh, the question I have for you is that which aortoiliac lesions give you the goosebumps before you start going after it? Which are the ones that you think you should take a step back and say, okay, you know, maybe I need to plan? Severely calcified nodular calcifications where you see like rocks in the iliacs uh, because these worry me a little bit about perforations. Despite using covered stents, uh, sometimes the covered stents do not take the, 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 the anatomy of the vessel and they can leak. So these are, I mean, CTOs you go through and all this, but these are the ones that I worry about. I think um, uh, Ben is gonna talk about involvement of con fem femoral. I want to ask um, uh, Dr. Soga uh, a very quick question. Uh, by the way, you know, there, there is a program called Iron Chef uh, um, America where experts from Japan present exotic things. 
I think we have to name something because I've never seen anyone walk off the table. Uh, <laughs> that well, I, want to, I want to tell you that you described the use of IVIS. My question is, narrate us a scenario where that IVIS use would allow you to make operative changes during the procedure. Let me ask you a quick question. You are crossing an occlusive disease and you have the simple question for the audience and your guide wire has gone in and out of the true lumen. How does that affect you by IVIS to make the decision for the next step? Uh, okay, the, the first is the optimal size of the balloon and the stent. The, for iliac CTO, the usually the vessel is shrinkage. Uh, therefore, so the, the, the like a CT scan, the uh, iris imaging, the I I iliac is a four or three millimeter very shrinkage the vessel. If you put the, the but, but the, the proximal iliac and the distal common femoral is much bigger, the eight, eight millimeter, the, then you put the eight millimeter uh, stent you, you used, uh, so data rupture risk has been occurred. So uh, actually, so my friend Dr. Iida reported that, uh, therefore, so to avoid the vessel rupture or late, the uh, optimal size decision uh, is a very useful by yeah. using the IVIS. That is great. Uh, we are going to ask you follow-up questions after the session because I have many follow-up, but I also imagine that may affect your decision to have the patient walk off or on the table. No, that was just a joke, but having said that, uh, let's move on to the one next. Question. Yes, Can I ask one, one more question? Uh, um, ben, I want to ask you a question. Uh, first, I want to know, do you do these complex aortoiliac endovascular procedures under general anesthesia or, or uh, conscious sedation? Because I know there's variability. And if you do it under uh, anesthesia, how do you determine, like, you know, we rely heavily on pain. And I always wonder, folks that do it under general anesthesia, and maybe you don't do it, I don't know, I'm asking. Uh, the people that do it under general anesthesia, how do you, they decide, you know, when to stop, when to push, and those kind of things. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I would say if, if there's no common femoral involvement, and I'm gonna be planning on a percutaneous approach, I'm, probably nine times out of 10 doing it under conscious sedation. Um, so I do use you know, pain as kind of a marker of how, how hard I can push. But um, patients you know, who are under general anesthesia are, are generally, you know, they might have worse disease and it's gonna be more challenging or I've tried under sedation and they can't hold still. Um, and those patients, and, and generally I have a pretty low threshold to use covered stents in the aortoiliac segment as I, I think I mentioned that yesterday. I, I prefer to just go straight to covered stenting instead of being in a you know a rush to to use a covered stent if I perforate. So I have a low threshold for covered stents. Okay, great. Well, I was setting up Dr. Metzger because I know he's going to show us some simple type A lesions <laughs> just for fun. Uh, Dr. Metzger, take it from here, man. Type D. Uh, thanks, Mehdi and uh, Subash. Great to be here uh, at CVI and talk about TAS D aortic disease. Uh, some considerations here in my disclosures. Uh, we've seen this a million times. Traditionally, TAS-D were treated surgically, but now a lot of them can appropriately be treated with endo because we have a lot better equipment and a lot better experience. Now, that said, for the more difficult cases, I strongly believe that they should only be performed by experienced operators, not early in the career or by low volume operators. You must, if you're not a surgeon, have a good relationship with your surgeons and you must have the full inventory in your lab, in the room, and be able to use it and know how to use it. These should be carefully planned, uh, not ad hoc. Almost all should have CT angiography ahead of time. All the alternatives should be carefully discussed with the patient and family and considered, and the patients and their family need to be well prepared and well informed when they come to the lab. In general, you're gonna need a lot of access, two, usually three, often three, and with larger sheaths with vascular ultrasound guided access. We use pressure monitors to monitor things and externalize wires frequently and use heparin throughout the case and check on the patient frequently. So some upfront considerations from your CT. 
is, what about the aorta? What's the size of it and how much disease is in it that's going to affect your stent choice? Uh, for the iliac treatment, can you preserve the bifurcation which you want to? And what's the status of the common femoria and the other important vessels that are adjacent to it? Some things you want to avoid. I say never enter the lateral wall of the aorta with reentry device. It, you know, it's just not a good thing. It's easy to hit. It's a bad thing to do. Um, you don't want to extend your CTO in the aorta iliac either north or south. Uh, and you'd like to preserve the bifurcation if you can, given the choice. Our case progression, I'm going to show you a bunch of cases next. Um, I like to access the good leg or the good arm first and then take pictures with a marker catheter and then use that catheter for a roadmap and use a combination of a roadmap and vascular ultrasound to get access in the CTO side. That's a great technique for EVAR and TAVAR as well. Uh, and then we get real close, mag up, we use roadmap and cross usually with a straight fly wire and an angled catheter. So let's look at some cases starting with the easy one. Here's a uh, iliac CTO. And this is a that technique of just roadmap and vascular ultrasound. And here, just magged up view, you can see uh, both the sheath and catheter from both sides and then simply uh, cross it and it crossed pretty easily. Change for support wire, both measure uh, with a balloon perform angioplasty, leave the balloon in for another measurement so you can pick your stents, and then carefully position the stents, preserving the bifurcation, and all done with a fairly easy case. Now, a lot of times you can't get retrograde, and so it, you have a low, low threshold for coming from the arm. Here you can cross antegrade uh, in that little nub, and then you don't re-enter uh, in a bad place in the aorta, crossing with an angle catheter and a straight glide wire, and then balloon and position your stents, preserve the bifurcation, and done. Now, sometimes you can't do that either way, and I think in the aortic -like disease, the Pioneer is a very useful catheter to have with the Chromaflow IVUS guidance. Here, somebody had three failed attempts for long uh, CTO, long lasting in terms of time. I almost made it a fourth uh, failed attempt. I tried to cross it from above, had significant difficulty, finally got a wire down there, Got a wire into the true limit of the internal iliac, but it's not a good re-entry as you'll see here in that red circle. That's not where you want to re-enter or start doing balloon work. So he came retrograde, got very close to that nub in the arrow, and that's where you want to hit the nub, and the, the Pioneer lets you hit that nub it, rather than the aorta and put your wire in as you see on that second panel above the yellow box and just send the wire northward. And now you're lumen to lumen and you can pick, uh, put your stent where it belongs. Um, you can do that from above as well. Here's a case uh, where I just done two weeks ago uh, where there's a nub distally. I got across from above, but that catheter is right next to but not in uh, the distal common iliac. You don't want to extend that to the bifurcation, so there's a pioneer and lets you finish the case. All right, what about calcium? We're going to deal with a lot in aorta iliacs. Here, didn't need to do anything in the aorta, but you sure did in the common iliac arteries. Here's the lithotripsy. Now they have eights. This was seven in the left common, the right common, and nice lumen without dissection. And then the covered VBX uh, stents positioned carefully above the internal iliac and at the aorta iliac bifurcation. Preserve the bifurcation with covered stents and nice final result. All right, let's get a little bit more difficult. What about severe calcium in the aorta? You really need to know what the size of the aorta is to plan your strategy. Uh, and we usually will do IVL, usually kissing IVL, followed by either CRAB or sometimes large knife metal stents or EVAR. Here's a live case we did here recently. Guy, terrible claudication. He had two prior aorta bifemoral operations um, in 2004. Heavy calcium you can see on those axial images and on the coronal images just terrible symptoms. Here's uh, the angiogram of the marker catheter. You can see on the red arrow a very important low accessory left renal artery and on the other downward arrow a inferior mesenteric artery that supplies both hypos which themselves are occluded. So those important preserved arteries. So here's a kissing shock wave with offset emitters followed by 035 IVUS. And now you got to think a little bit. This is a careful stent strategy from above we put a VBX above those renal arteries and the inferior mesenteric. Nice result there. Now we want to preserve the bifurcation down to the bottom arrow. So this is a 16 by 60 nitinol uh, Aubrey venous stent, post dilated, 
got a very nice result in the aorta. Uh, no pressure gradient, but on that dotted arrow, notice the de diminished flow in the hypo, I'm sorry, in the inferior mesenteric, which supplied the hypos. So the nitinol stent lets you get a tour guide in there and do an IBIS-directed drug-living stent and preserve uh, the inferior mesenteric artery. Finally, what about aortic occlusions? Um, this is a lady, literally 50 years old, had occluded for 20 years, okay? Small underfilled aorta, um, a lot of other comorbidities. I mandated that she see a vascular surgeon for a full consultation, um, and then three separate consults to really discuss this. Uh, decided to do this endo, there's an underfilled iliacs. We crossed on the right retrograde. We were able to cross on the left retrograde in the lumen there. And here you can see the short distance from the renals to the um, bifurcation. So I thought we were doing conservative angioplasty with five by 80 balloons. This is significant dissection, you know, and that's why you gotta know what you're doing in, in these and be able to get out of trouble and just relax here. Uh, we just took the uh, sheets back and found the uh, dissection uh, definition. Here's an eight by 59 VBX large. Remember that can go up to 16 if you need it. You didn't need it there, um, so that's in the aorta. And then we rewired the VBX, uh, non-compliant balloon, um, and then placed our CRAB VBXs. You see a nice result on the left, but again, dissection still there on the right. The nice thing about triple axis from the arm, you can wire the internal iliac and perform IVUS. You can see the big flap there. And so we put a nitinol stent in that, and there's a final result. All the, everything uh, nicely tacked up, good result. And this is six months CT angiography with everything being widely patent. Last case, sometimes we've just heard that uh, CTOs can coexist with sacular or with aneurysms, as is the case here, a left coronal artery aneurysm. Here's very carefully crossing it, staying within the lumen of the uh, CTO and into the aneurysm. Balloon, redefine it. And here we put in a covered stent there as a landing zone right above the bifurcation and then brought a uh, bifurcated stent graft, which I think you have to have uh, if you do a lot of complex aorta elect work because that'll seal the bifurcation, perf, and this is just bringing it down inside it, ballooning it, and nice final result, fixing both the aneurysm and the CTO. So in conclusions, I think uh, TAS-D uh, lesions can be treated with endovascular provided you plan it carefully uh, and use careful technique and a collaborative multidisciplinary approach. Thank you very much for your attention. Chris, good we didn't uh, title your talk Standard Approaches, is that right? Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think the unsaid, uh, un unstated, is the contiguous involvement of aortoiliac and uh, common femoral artery. And to talk about hybrid approach to simultaneous aortoiliac and CFA disease, we invite Dr. Benjamin uh, Colbert. Ben, take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to speak. <coughs> okay, um, <coughs> these are my disclosures. Um, so we all know in this room uh, there are three difficult areas of the lower extremity to treat by endovascular means specifically, and what we're going to focus on today is the common femoral artery, um, but also popliteal artery and tibial occlusions that extend across the ankle and into the foot related to dynamic forces with motion, small vessel size, and as well as the lack of specific devices to address these targets. So <coughs> hybrid, uh, for patients with concomitant femoral and aortoiliac occlusive disease, uh, the hybrid approach for revascularization is the first line for a majority of patients. It combines open surgical, surgical techniques as well as endovascular interventions um, and is ideal for cases of multi-level occlusive disease. Most commonly, we're dealing with two levels being uh, femoral and aortoiliac, but uh, occasionally we'll do, uh, uh, you know, aortoiliac, common femoral, and even SFA or tibial disease if needed, depending on the presentation of the patient, whether they're a clodicant, a patient with rest pain, or a patient with an ischemic wound. <coughs> So this is just a kind of an example of what we're talking about, the difference between management of aortoiliac disease via a hybrid approach. On the left here, you see the patient has two groin incisions, and then, of course, we go up and stent the aortoiliac segment versus the traditional approach, and in this case, a retroperitoneal approach for an aortobifemoral bypass. Uh, on the left, the patient 
you know, generally patients can go home in one to two days after groin incisions, whereas, uh, you know, uh, open revascularization, you know, at least four to seven days in the hospital recovering. This is a, uh, <coughs> a patient who uh, presented with wet gangrene of her right first toe. Um, she was an active smoker with poorly controlled diabetes, hypertension, and COPD, uh, generally a very frail woman uh, who had this uh, right toe wound for many months as well as uh, some small ulcers on the left foot as well. But she presented with pedal sepsis uh, related to this right first toe wound. Um, and the first order of business in any patient presenting with a uh, wet gangrene of the toe is obviously to undergo source control. So in close uh, collaboration with our podiatry colleagues, this patient underwent a, a first ray resection um, and subsequently, and this was done as an emergency and then subsequently we were able to do a vascular evaluation, uh, which as you can see, the ABI on the right, 0.48 with the toe pressure uh, on the remaining toes of zero. Um, uh, and, and actually the, the femoral waveforms you see here are, are not that bad. However, on exam, the femoral pulses were very weak. Um, and of course she had non-palpable pedal pulses. So I got a CT scan in this case. You can see significant uh, aortoiliac calcification. Uh, no complete occlusions in this case, but uh, dense calcification of uh, mainly the common iliac extending into the external and then as well as uh, common femoral artery disease as well. And then you can see multifocal uh, stenoses in the superficial femoral artery. So the plan for this patient, uh, given the extent of tissue loss, I wanted to get a wide open pipe from the, basically from the heart to the toe. So I was gonna treat everything um, here. So we st um, this is a representative image here showing uh, um, a common femoral endarterectomy with a bifurcated patch. So in this case, we were able to patch onto the profunda to get that open um, for long-term durability. Um, and then we patch onto the SFA and we can uh, advance the sheath through the suture line prior to completing the entire anastomosis and then go up into the aortoiliac segment and then when we're complete with that part, we flip the, the sheath and go down the leg to treat whatever is needed uh, in the case of uh, uh, patients with wounds. Uh, importantly, whenever this is on the left side, the, probably the most common configuration of uh, femoral revascularization, which is an iliofemoral endarterectomy and a profundoplasty. Um, so uh, the basic tenets here are that you want to do your endarterectomy and patch beyond the femoral artery. So you want to patch into areas that you can later stent. Um, that way, you, if there's disease in the external iliac artery or the SFA, you can leave no disease behind with your hybrid approach. Um, it al allows for significant uh, creativity in addressing common femoral uh, disease. So there's you know the standard bovine single patch onto the profunda or the SFA. Um, we can create bifurcated patches um, in some patients who may have, you know, some aneurysmal disease or more commonly patients who have had multiple endarterectomies of the femoral artery, um, the artery is not really suitable to be re-endarterectomized. It kind of just falls apart. So in uh, some occasions we'll have to replace the whole thing. And in this case, you can uh, consider doing a small bifurcated repair like this. Um, after that, um, this is just kind of showing how we perform the iliofemoral endarterectomy, you need to pull up on the inguinal ligament and get way up on the external iliac artery. That way you can uh, stent into your patch and leave no disease behind there. Um, in this case, um, <coughs> we, uh, you can see actually angiographically, it's not the worst, um, not the worst uh, stenosis in the common iliac artery, you know, not difficult to cross here, but I used a combination of covered and uncovered stents in order to uh, create a nice lumen and preserve the internal iliac artery. And in this case, the distal external iliac artery was not diseased and we didn't need to stent into our patch here. Um, after this, we, oh, could you press play on these videos? Uh, I flipped the sheath to go down the leg in order to give her inline flow to this uh, large foot wound. Um, you can see again, not, you know, nothing too difficult to cross here, no, no chronic occlusions, but, um, and nice runoff below the knee. Uh, this was treated uh, with drug-coated balloon angioplasty uh, with a nice result if you'll click play on those videos. Um, brisk flow, and, and, and I always uh, uh, remind the trainees that, you know, in a patient with critical limb ischemia, you must do a foot shot um, to see what the perfusion to your wound is if you can pr press play on this one. 
So nice, uh, brisk float all the way down to the foot with a good wound flush there. Um, so this patient <coughs> followed up at six months with a completely healed uh, wound. Uh, very happy patient. This traumatic event had convinced her to quit smoking, and I've actually seen her um, for a couple of years after this, and she uh, remains uh, off cigarettes, thankfully. Um, at six months, the ABI was uh, perfect. Um, you can see at two years, the ABI has dropped a little bit, um, which is consistent with probably restenosis of her SFA, and I like to say, you know, the SFA is, it's important for wound healing, and it gives you a pretty picture, but the profunda is the junkyard dog that keeps the leg alive forever. So, uh, in conclusion, um, <clears throat> hybrid revascularization for critical limb, limb ischemia is safe and durable uh, in well-selected patients and allows for significant creativity in addressing complex femoral artery uh, occlusive disease. Um, important to ensure that you, you patch and stent uh, beyond the, the initial areas of disease to leave no uh, intervening disease behind. Uh, always take a foot shot for the podiatry's sake and respect the profunda because uh, your SFA is going to go down after the wound heals, hopefully, and the profunda will keep the patient out of the ER. Thank you. Ben, thank you so much. That's great advice and great presentation. So, Ben, I'm going to start with you with a question. We haven't really talked about uh, aneurysmal uh, atherosclerotic disease, right? You know, the ones that they have some degree of aneurysm. There may be an aortic aneurysm with a common iliac stenosis or occlusion. The aneurysm is not big enough. Let's say it's three and a half, four. Or sometimes you have iliac aneurysm on one side and you may have an occlusion or stenotic, stenotic lesion on the other side. As a surgeon, when should uh, those be approached endovascularly focusing on the stenosis and when should they be considered? Like what goes through your mind when you decide, okay, I'm gonna treat the whole thing versus you know what, this is only four. I'm gonna treat the stenotic with a stent, but I don't wanna burn any bridges going forward. Yeah, that, that's uh, an important, important topic. Um, I think there's, you know, when you see a patient in the clinic who has combined aneurysmal and occlusive disease, you really have to get down to what is your indication for doing something for this patient. Is the indication that they have rest pain? And so if the aneurysm is small, then we can plan to do, uh, you know, some kind of angioplasty or stenting, keeping in mind that you're gonna continue to, fo to follow this patient and like you said, you don't want to do, you know, kissing iliac stents and burn a bridge for a, you know, relatively simple EVAR down the road. Um, and I think it's important, you know, if you're going to have to do something more extensive to make sure that your indication is, you know, is serious. So, you know, if someone is, I don't want to say just a clodicant, but if they're, you know, still smoking, they're clodicating, they're still working, I might, and you know the intervention is going to be complicated and and risk making the aneurysm treatment difficult down the road. I may delay that um, and treat when there's an indication to treat the aneurysm. Dr. Metzger, you were going to say something, I think. Uh, quick uh, comment. First, Ben, I'm going to borrow that junkyard dog and profunda thing. I like that a lot. Um, so for Dr. Ansari, a, a constructive thought. I would change your title of your talk not to "I wish I would have called the vascular surgeon," to "I wish I would have done the CT angiogram." And I want to make the point, and it just, it, it's one of those that, um, just a point for everybody, just like Dimitri uh, emphasized, the CT angiogram up front for aortic disease is huge. And the other time I think it's huge is for acute limb ischemia or subacute limb ischemia. And especially in your presentation, Matt, you had mentioned, hey, they had had surgical procedure, a bunch of procedures, you didn't know what those procedures were, and you got a leg that doesn't move. And the point that's meant con constructively is a CT angiogram will take you 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll help plan. And you would have not spent those two days of misery that you showed us with a lot of work to get out of trouble, but a CT angiogram up front uh, in critical, you know, it's one thing down below the uh, inguinal lingua, anything above with critical limb scan. I think a CT angiogram is one thing to consider up front. I no, agree. I, I agree. You're Sorry. completely correct. That was a big mistake over there that the CT scan was not done, and they would give all the reasons. But this, is, this case is one of those cases when I started the program. Before I went to Texas Tech, there was no program there. People used to come in with acute limb, and they used to be the rail to who? That's the, there were no, surgeons were not even on call for acute limbs. It was a very, very different program. Now we have a center of excellence. That was a journey over the period of five years that we came to here. 
Now the algorithms, patient comes in what needs to be done, but before that, it was nothing like that. But I think you have a great, ad in general, I think it's a great advice, uh, Chris, in a sense that for aortic failure, I can always say for, you know, infrainguinal, I find it challenging, especially for tibial work. But I think for aortoiliac, you know, you should get it done because it does help. Also a calcification, all the things you guys mentioned today, I think those are important. Um, you know, uh, Subhash, I, I was gonna ask about the common femoral. So maybe I, I, I move to uh, Mac and, and Mac, you know, tell us, you know, we talk about common femoral disease and we know the important, uh, importance of outflow when you talk about aortoiliac disease. We say the same thing for SFA pop disease, the outflow. So the common femoral is the outflow. What is considered significant common femoral disease when you talk about aortoiliac? Is it just, is it 90% uh, and then you should think about hybrid or treating both? When do you say, you know what, there is enough common femoral disease that I think I need to think about not only treating the occlusive disease in the aortoiliac, but I also need to worry about the common femoral. Do you have a cut point, some kind of a guidance? So my thing is the symptoms of what the patient is feeling how symptomatic the patient is. Because usually I have seen with the collateral circulation around the internals, if there's occlusion in the aortoiliac region, the patient will not be that symptomatic if the collateral circulation is, is there. But with common femoral being significant, in addition to the aortoiliac, patient will have severe symptoms. So when we talk about rest pain, and people say, okay, he's just having pain. No, rest pain is ischemia going on in the leg. So I, I do the question in a very serious manner, and yes, imaging helps, but you would have patients having severe calcification, but you will see good flow over there, and the patient might or might not have symptoms decide, depending on that. When we talk about numbness or tingling or this, there are a lot of people have peripheral neuropathy, it's difficult to test, but they would have the pain over there, they would have the discomfort, feeling fatigued, tired, unable to walk, they would have these severe symptoms. So I think symptomology in my case plays a big role in my patients. Okay, great. Dr. Sogai, uh, uh, Sensei Soga, you do a lot of IVIS. When do you think that you consider common femoral to be having significant disease? Do you use hemodynamic? Do you use the IVIS? What is considered significant common femoral disease when you're dealing with aortoiliac occlusion, occlusive disease? Oh, uh, well, yeah. That's right, so de depending on the symptom or something, the, from, from the IVIS finding, the usually common femoral disease is a very solitary and very calcified. Uh, it's not easy to just only bone and your plasty. Uh, but but in, in Japan, so attracting device is not commercially available. Uh, therefore, so we have only bone and your plasty. Uh, therefore, it, it's very e not easy, difficult to treat that. Uh, so especially so co continuous lesion involving the common femoral artery is a big, big issue in Japan as well. Uh, maybe, uh, n n n how, how do you say, uh, maybe 90% or 75% or more is a very severe stenosis. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Mazen, uh, talk to me about, uh, you know, we talked about calcification, you know, we showed great cases, you know, Dr. Metzger, uh, you know, the IVL, and, you know, we, we are lucky we now have IVL, but before IVL, when you see these nodules, and you said that, you know, that's the thing that bothers you the most, how does that change your strategy? Uh, you said that that's what gives you concern, but does that change your strategy and how does it change your strategy? I thought you were gonna ask me a simpler question than you asked them because their question was pretty tough. I'm glad you skipped over me. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think the technology we have now is definitely helpful and IVL helps, maybe not great for nodular carcinoma, it absolutely helps. Um, y you know, these are, these are the patients I wanna make sure I have good access, good sheath. I know we're gonna use uh, covered stents um, start with small balloons, see how the lesions, you know, are kind of reacting, how tough and how bad they are. Um, and if, if, if it really bothers me a lot, it's not a bad idea to stop. Obviously, you have all the imaging, get a surgical opinion. I think that's important. We're, thankfully, I work in a place where the surgeons and I, like, we are very good colleagues. So I think getting this approach from different opinions uh, will help a lot. Uh, let me ask a question from Peter. Peter, uh, you went over the devices. 
uh, obviously sometimes difficult to have every device or most of the devices. What are the crucial devices when you're dealing with complex aortoiliac disease, especially the large, I noticed, for example, Chris used the uh, venous stem to deal with the aorta because of the size, I'm assuming. So, but the radial, and they have the reasonable radial strength, those venous stents. What are the things you, you suggest that we should have at the minimum? Uh, you know, I'll also go back to Dr. Metzger's slide where you, you start from the disasters and work your way back, you know? So if you're gonna be working in an area where you have to think about perforation, meaning fairly rapid death, You've got to make sure you've got your, your covered stents, both in self-expanding and balloon expandable, your large sheaths, your uh, aortic and, and iliac occlusive balloons available to you. I think you want to have a good roster of just good old-fashioned balloon expanding and self-expanding stents as well, um, uh, set to size. I, I now IVIS every iliac and every aorta. Do you need it? No, but it's dramatically changed both the way I um, reach destination therapy for sizing, my preparation for disasters, because it's great to know in advance what size your covered stent will be. It's even changed the way I cross, uh, you know, back to the conversation about crossing. If I'm coming from above and below and I'm not sure where I connect the dots, I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable doing rendezvous or cart if I have IVIS guidance for that in the iliacs, whereas I'm not doing that blind in the, in the iliac. I, I think we have heard fantastic talks and on the surface, these talks may seem disconnected, but you can see how the presenters have connected it for us. I just want to end this wonderful session with gratitude to all the speakers, but most importantly, that the Iota Iliac Air Territory has a special place of respect for all endovascular specialists. And I do think that if there is one area where an ad hoc procedure is not needed, and perhaps great amount of planning and equipment selection is probably holds the greatest amount of relevance, I think it is the aortoiliac. So imaging, case planning, device selection, and a priori bailout options clearly identified. A recipe for clear success in a long lasting successful interventional career. So with that, let's uh, end the session here and take a good uh, cup of coffee and break and re reassemble again for the limb salvage and wound care exactly at 3.30 p.m. Thank you all.